Um, our next speaker is Dr. Kevin Gard. He's a physical therapist. He's a clinical professor in the program, as well as director of the Doctor of Physical Therapy program here at Drexel. He's vice chair of the physical therapy and uh, rehabilitation sciences department. He's also part of our team at the uh, uh, Running Performance and Research Center, uh, and he does gait analysis with our group. Um, he's going to speak about <clears throat> uh, pre-race, race day, and recovery strategies from a PT perspective. Welcome, Dr. Kevin Gard. So do I need to change this or, okay, we're good. All right, I'm gonna do this, I got this. So welcome, thanks for coming. Uh, it's, it's great to see uh, so many people here as well as uh, on the uh, webcast. Um, I thought it might be helpful. So obviously like uh, Rob mentioned, I'm gonna try and concentrate on the physical aspects of uh, training specific to uh, the Broad Street Run. And I was really trying to come up with things that are a little bit different in terms of um, you know, you can read a lot of stuff like in Runner's World, online, that sort of thing. But I wanted to try and uh, explore maybe some different things, uh, perhaps in this talk, things that maybe you haven't encountered, as well as cover some of, some of the more basic things for people who are uh, perhaps new to the race. And I thought where we'd start is to just uh, cover a couple facts regarding the Broad Street uh, race. Broad Street, I didn't grow up in the Philadelphia area, but Broad Street, I think, is one of those like classic races that happens in Philadelphia. Everyone talks about Broad Street Race. It, you, you meet an awful lot of people that have done the, the race overall. It's considered one of the uh, largest and fastest 10-mile races uh, in the country. It's uh, mostly considered to be a very fast race because from point to point, it is a net downhill to it, which doesn't mean necessarily for uh, people who are running it for the first time. You shouldn't expect to be going downhill the entire time. It uh, goes up and down a little bit, but there are no big hills in it at all. And uh, if you measure from the very start of it to the very finish of it, it, like I said before, is a net downhill to it. <clears throat> Weather-wise, if you look at the average temperature uh, for the entire existence of the race itself, uh, the average high has been about 71. But realize that's the average high for that day. And the race is run at, I think, start times 8.30 or so. So typically, we're not close to that 71 at all. We're a little closer to the average low temperature, which is 51 degrees. However, I've run Broad Street a couple times where it's been down in that 50 degree range, but it's very, very humid that day. So it can feel much hotter than what it is, okay? So as we go through tips and stuff, I think it's important to understand what the weather conditions could be and understand what the variability could be so that you are just prepared for different types of conditions. You don't want to start, you don't want to uh, show up at the starting line with wearing clothing when you're expecting it to be 80 degrees and it's actually only 50 degrees. Likewise, you don't want to expect it to be 80 degrees and it, it turns out to be 50. So you just need to uh, be prepared for those things. And it was 91 degrees in uh, 2000. Hopefully that uh, doesn't happen this year. <clears throat> in terms of the course itself, it runs from Central High School, which is just a little bit south of the Fern Rock um, uh, subway stop, if you're familiar with that. It goes straight down Broad Street. It actually has two turns in it. The turns are around City Hall, and you end in the Navy Yard. So a good point here is if you're ever running on a street, you look up at a street, and it doesn't say Broad Street, you have made a wrong turn, okay? And that's important to know because this does happen. There was recently a race that uh, people actually ran an extra 3K in a 10K race when the marshal who was supposed to be there actually went to take a bathroom break, and they ended up taking the wrong turn, Okay. This shouldn't happen with Broad Street, because like I said, you should be going down exactly the same path all the time. But if you also find that there aren't runnings in front of you or you're not on Broad Street, you know you've gone the wrong direction, okay? And the last thing here is uh, recognize there is drug testing related to uh, the Broad Street run. It's on their website that they will drug test people. So if anyone's uh, planning on channeling their inner Ben Johnson, you should uh, perhaps consider a different race that doesn't do drug testing, right? It's a tough crowd, that's a joke. <laughs> Just kidding. Uh, right. um, the 10 mile race, it's distance itself, not a very common distance. You don't see a lot of 10 mile races themselves, but it's a really fun distance uh, to run. An awful lot of people have commented on this. You know, uh, comments that you hear, it's uh, short enough that you can really run it hard, you can really race it, but yet it's long enough to brag about it to your friends. Not everyone runs uh, 10 mile races. Bill Rogers, who's perhaps one of the most famous American runners, uh, said while it might not take as much, it may not as while it may not require as much training as the marathon, it takes the heart of a lion to race the ten. Okay, so really, if you haven't ever run a ten mile race, it's a really really fun distance. I think you're really going to find that you uh, enjoy it. So let's get to the ten tips for the uh, ten miles themselves. So the number one tip is regarding your taper. Okay, 
If you're not familiar uh, with what a taper is when you are training for uh, long distances, the taper is a period of time. Uh, and generally, it, uh, the, the length of that taper differs depending upon the length of the race that you're going to run. So the classic is for the marathon. Normally, the, t the taper is three weeks or so, although there's a little bit of variability. You see uh, differences in the literature as, as far as how long that taper should be. And then for races that become shorter, the taper often becomes shorter. Okay, But the purpose of the taper really is to cut down the number of miles that you're running, cut down the strength training that you're doing, so that your body can recover from all the breakdown that you've uh, put it through, through your training, so that you can increase your glycogen stores, you can repair muscle and that sort of thing, so that hopefully you get to the starting line in tip-top shape, ready to go, okay? What oftentimes people use the taper for is to catch up on all the training that they didn't do, okay? They all of a sudden, oh my God, you know, today the race is two and a half weeks away. I really meant to train more than I did. So I really got to get out here and just start nailing it, you know, really start doing distances and that sort of thing so that I'm ready for the race, okay? If you do that in the race, realize that you will show up at the starting line with depleted glycogen stores, muscles um, torn up, you know, not in tip-top condition, and ultimately your performance will not be as good as what it should be, okay? Now, how long uh, the taper is going to be, I mentioned before, there's a lot of variability in that. Some of the variability uh, depends upon what the purpose of the race is for you. And what I mean by that is some people might use this 10-mile race as uh, simply a training run. You know, they're training for a half marathon or a marathon later in the year, and they're simply trying to use this 10-mile race as for training purposes, okay? In that case, uh, those individuals may not taper at all. They may do their regular training this entire week, show up on race day, run that, and then go right back into their training next week, okay? For someone who is, uh, this is their first 10-mile race, or this is the race that they are really training for, generally a two-week taper or so is perfectly adequate, all right? So that would mean that you're going to do your last long run this weekend, and then you're going to start tapering over the next couple weeks. So next week, you would decrease your mileage, uh, you know, normal rule of thumb is somewhere between 25 or 30 percent or so. And then the next week after that, you're going to uh, back off on your mileage a little bit more, too. OK, um, again, there's a lot of variability here, just depending upon uh, your ability and that sort of thing. But general rule of thumb is that you'd run no more than seven miles if you're a pretty experienced runner the weekend before the race. So the, the last week before the race, if, the, if you were a little bit newer to the sport, that may only be four or five miles that, that weekend before, okay? The week of the run, you'll do a couple shorter, quicker uh, paced runs. So you may do uh, some faster runs of perhaps three to five miles or so. The idea there is to try and keep yourself sharp. It also helps build or uh, burn a little bit of energy because you're gonna find over that taper that you have all this extra energy. You know, you've been training a lot over the last couple of weeks and all of a sudden you're decreasing that. So you also find out you got all this like, uh, pent-up energy that you, you'd like to um, uh, get rid of. Uh, when you do your last run, and there's a lot of variability in this too. Um, generally, I do my last runs on Thursday before the race, and then I rest Friday, Saturday, and then I'm ready to run on Sunday. There's an awful lot of people that like to run on Saturday before the race and go out for a really short run that day. My feeling on that is you've got everything to lose in that little short run and very, very little to gain. All right. And what I mean by that is you could easily go out on that day, twist your ankle, you know, tweak something, that sort of thing, and really compromise your performance on that Sunday. And that little short run, I don't think, does very much in terms of helping your performance. Okay. But again, you got to kind of find what works for you. And there's no hard and fast rules in this. You're not going to go find a research study that shows that running a really short uh, distance on the Saturday before your race really helps improve performance, just like you're going to find. Uh, you're not going to find some research studies that shows that it doesn't help either. So you got to kind of find uh, what works for you. In terms of strength training, you want to start decreasing the volume of your strength training about two weeks before too. So decreasing the number of times you do strength training, decreasing the amount of weight that you, you lift, and then eliminate the strength training altogether about five to seven days before the race. So that last week before the race, you really shouldn't be doing any strength training at all. Just be resting and ultimately getting ready. Okay. You want to try and stay off your feet as much as you can that last week. I know that's nearly impossible for most people if they've got regular jobs, that sort of thing. But clearly the day before, if you can do that, try and find or engage in activities where you can rest, okay, where you can be off your feet. Go see a movie, 
read, watch TV, that sort of thing. You're really trying to, you know, let your body rest and recover so that when you get to that starting line, you're ultimately ready to go. Okay. Don't be surprised in your taper period. People complain of, of aches and pains during that time. I don't know, Dr. Whitman might be able to speak to this, whether or not this is more psychological more than anything else, but people will report that, that they feel, you know, also know oh, I feel this ache in my knee and that sort of thing. Just realize that's part of the normal process. We'll sort of talk as we go through this tips uh, where you might become concerned about some of those aches and pains, but uh, realize in the taper you might feel some of these. And most people re um, report feeling a little uh, stir crazy. I don't know if any of you guys remember the stir crazy popcorn popper and stuff. People, again, related to this like pent up energy, they just feel like they've got all this energy and they feel like they're, they're going nuts during this period. Some people will describe the taper period as being the most difficult part of their training overall. Okay. And this is where it's important, like focus on different things. So you've done all your training, you've done all your running uh, previous to this. So focus on different things. Okay. Focus on Dr. Whitman's going to talk about more of the mental aspects of running. So focus on that mental aspect of running, visualize yourself running the race, how you want to perform that particular day, find other activities to do, start reading a book, go see movies, spend time with the family that you've ignored while you've been doing all of your training and that sort of thing. Okay. And that'll help you ultimately get through uh, this taper period. The taper period is really important. It is part of the training process. So you don't want to, just like you, you try not to skimp on any of your runs, you really don't want to skimp on your taper either. Okay. In terms of apparel on race day, okay, realize these are races. It's not a fashion show. Okay. So uh, you shouldn't be trying to present a new you on, on race day in terms of the clothes that you wear. Okay. Uh, my feeling is the apparel you wear, the, tra the training that you do um, before the race is also training for the apparel you're going to wear on race day, okay? So you should be trying things out as you're training so that on race day you wear things that you wore while you trained, okay? Because you want to know that those clothes are comfortable for you to wear that entire 10 miles, Okay. And, you know, you've experienced, all of you guys have experienced this before. You wear a new pair of shorts or a new shirt, new shoes, new socks, whatever, and there's a seam in them that irritates your skin. You don't want to find that out three or four miles into the race and then have to run another seven you know, miles or so while that thing is irritating you, okay? So that's why you should not be wearing the Broad Street shirt that they give out that day because you didn't train in it, okay? Wear that after the race, all right? Wear the clothing that you're uh, accustomed to, all right? Uh, we get a lot of questions about uh, compression sleeves. And when I refer to compression sleeves, I'm really talking about the um, ones that you wear on your calves and that sort of thing. You get questions regarding, like, do they really help performance and that sort of thing. The interesting thing, there, is some there are some studies in the literature that actually show that they do help improve uh, performance. The entire uh, story really isn't clear on them yet. We don't know how much they improve performance. We don't know at what distances they imp improve performance. But there are some suggestions in the literature that they do help. Okay. But again, what I would say with these is if you haven't trained with those particular things, you don't want to go out and buy them the day before the race, the week before the race, and decide that day you're going you're gonna to try them. Okay. I wouldn't even try them during your taper. At this point, you know, if you haven't really trained with them, then you might purchase them and decide to use them for your next race. Okay. Number three is in terms of goal setting. And Dr. Whitman, I think we'll talk a little bit more about this. I have just a couple of general things uh, to talk about here. What I always do with my races, which I think uh, works pretty well, is I always um, set three goals. Okay. To me, running is a very, very cruel sport uh, to participate in. And what I mean by that is your training can go perfectly well. You know, you're hitting all the times that you want to hit. You're running the distances that you want to run, that sort of thing. And then you may show up on race day and it's 90 degrees, okay? Or it's extremely cold, or you just don't feel very well that day, or you just don't have it for whatever reason, okay? So I think that's why you need to be flexible and really choose three different goals for yourself that day. So the first goal is really the, I hit it out of the park day. You know, everything went right. I got out the start line, felt great, and I just felt great kind of as I we went. Okay, so you set a goal for that. Second goal is sort of the okay result. Like, I'm pretty happy with this. Things didn't go perfectly. I didn't feel perfect throughout the entire race, but I felt pretty good. And then the third one is the, you know, the tires fell off. Okay. Uh, a couple of years ago, uh, I used to coach for a team in training. 
We went up to the uh, Long Branch uh, half and full marathons up there. We got there that day, and it was unbelievably hot, unseasonably hot that day. Okay, and We had to tell all of our participants that day, forget about those first two goals that you have. You were going basically for the, you know, sort of the wheels fell off. The conditions are just brutal out there today. So you really have to ramp it back and try and go for that third goal here. Because if you don't, if you really try and go for that top goal, just based on weather conditions, you're probably not going to make it. Okay. So I would have sort of those three goals in mind um, to work towards. Okay. A couple studies that I wanted to present to you too. First study on the left side. Uh, looked at 123 runners. They uh, put them into seven days of Epsom salts. I had them soak for seven consecutive days in Epsom salts, not continuously for periods of time uh, during that time. And what they did was they had uh, people run different uh, distances um, and timed them. Okay, And they wanted to compare their time uh, before they soaked in these Epsom salts and then after they soaked in these Epsom salts and see if uh, they were different. And what they found was that uh, the people that soaked in the Epsom salts, they decreased their mile pace by about 30 seconds. Okay. Second study on the right, they looked at 96 runners, and they evaluated the quantity and quality in terms of brightness of the tape that they wore on different joints, different areas of their body and stuff. And they found that people who wore the most amount of tape and the brightest amount of tape typically won the race. All right. So what I really wanted to get across to you here was is if you soak in Epsom salts during the taper, and you wear lots of colored, brightly colored tape on race day, you, you have a really good chance of winning this race. Okay? So, so those are sort of some take-home messages I think you should, um, should think about, right? Now, obviously, this is not true. These are published in the Journal of Irre Irreproducible Results. Okay? And my point really to you here is there is a lot of advice out there. All right? You're going to get advice from people you know, people you respect. You go on the web, look for advice, that sort of thing. And I think the thing you should realize is a lot of that advice isn't very accurate. Okay? And I don't mean to like uh, cause controversy here, but an example I'll give is think about barefoot running. Okay? And think about barefoot running like five years ago. It really sounded like the thing everybody should do. Okay? And today, what we know is that barefoot running may not be for everyone. Okay, and we know that there are certain running types or individuals, certain foot types and that sort of thing that may not do well with barefoot running. There are certain people that do great with it, and that's fantastic, but there are other people that perhaps shouldn't be doing that. Okay, so you really have to take uh, running advice sort of with a grain of salt and, real, and really evaluate it and figure out if it's appropriate for you. Okay, and again, I would uh, suggest this is all part of your training period too where you're trying some of these things out to see ultimately if they work for you. And as Nairi pointed out before, I don't think there, if uh, race time or immediately before race time is the time where you want to start experimenting with some of this uh, advice that you've got. Okay. My fifth tip is really to follow your routine. Okay. And I mentioned this a couple times. Your training is your routine. Okay. So during that training, you've tested out clothes. As Nairi pointed out, you've tested your nutrition, so you've tried different goos, gels, hydration, that sort of thing, what you eat before you actually go out and run, so that you should have all of that worked out before uh, race day. And from a physical training standpoint, you should have some idea of what sort of pace you're going to run to, okay? Because your training should have evolved, involved trying different paces, running at different paces, that sort of thing, to figure out where, what pace you're, you can run that 10 miles at. OK, so my suggestion to you, my tip to you is to follow that routine. You've done all this training. You've tested all this stuff out. Now don't throw it all away. Make sure you follow that routine as you um, go towards the race. OK, in terms of injuries and that sort of thing, I think we should spend a little bit of time here and give you some some tips related to this. So most common running injuries that we see uh, generally, do we have an injury here? No? Yes, maybe? OK. So most common uh, injuries that we usually see far left here is related to uh, pain around the kneecap, okay? Uh, second one there is IT band, uh, things like stress fractures, plantar fasciitis, Achilles tendonitis. Those are common running injuries um, that we see with people, okay? Now, if these injuries have happened before the race, you're suffering with an injury right now or in the next uh, week or so, it's really important that you see someone as soon as possible, and best if you can see someone who has 
some experience in running, okay? Because generally, this big generalization, if you see someone who doesn't have experience in running, their answer is gonna be, don't run, right? Which isn't a very satisfying answer to a runner, okay? So you wanna see someone who's got experience in running because oftentimes that individual has some tricks that they might be able to use. So there might be braces, tape, stretches, exercises, inserts and in shoes that you might be able to use that might help you get to the race and at least be able to run the race itself, okay? Now ultimately realize the answer that you might get from the individual you'd see, even if that person has experienced it, might be you can't run because the injury is significant enough, okay? But hopefully that isn't the case, but you need to find that out um, as quickly as you can, okay? And if you do need to cancel, it's not the end of the world, okay? All of us eventually, if you run for long enough, will have to bail out of a race at some point, okay? Because you get hurt or conditions aren't right or whatever, okay? And there are plenty of races to jump into after that. And you don't really wanna injure yourself more by running the race and then, and then prolonging your injury and extending the amount of time that you're out, okay? If you get hurt during the race, realize there are, there's medical personnel along the race route itself as well as uh, police officers and that sort of thing. So if you get hurt along the race, make sure you grab one of those people to get help. Some of those medical personnel will be, able, will be out there to, and can help you with certain things. If you have blisters and that sort of thing, they'll have padding, uh, band-aids, that sort of thing, and they'll be able to help you right there and hopefully get you back out on the uh, race course immediately. If your injury is serious enough, they'll be able to transport you to the end of the race to get to your family and friends and that sort of thing, okay? Um, things that you should watch out for in terms of injury, either uh, before the race or after the race itself, sort of general rules of thumb here. If you have pain that's persistent for three or four, three to five days or more, you know, pain that, that lingers on, generally that is concerning to us and something uh, that you should go see somebody about. If your pain prevents running or it alters your form or makes you limp, those are things that, that really, really concern us too. And those are probably reasons why you should go see somebody and ultimately get evaluated, okay? If you get little aches and pains, everyone knows with running, you get aches and pains. It's just part of what happens. But if those aches and pains generally resolve within a day or so, we're less concerned about those types of things, okay? Tip number seven, crowd control. If you've never run a race before, um, uh, you may not be familiar with how crowded it is at the beginning, especially a race like Broad Street. When I uh, first started running Broad Street back in like 2004, 2005, there were about 7,000 runners who ran it then, and I thought it was crowded then. Now there's about 30,000 runners or so. And think about running, packing 30,000 runners into Broad Street, which isn't a very wide street to begin with anyway. It is very, very crowded, okay? Now Broad Street since uh, 2004, 2005 has gone to their crowd system so that they can control those crowds a little bit better, but it's still crowded. Okay, so at the very, very beginning of the race, you need to be careful because there are an awful lot of people there. Uh, I ran with a woman before, trained for a marathon, uh, is up at the Long Branch uh, Marathon up in New Jersey, and within the first 10 feet, she stumbled over someone, fell down, broke her wrist, her race was done. Okay, you don't want that to happen to you after you've done all of this training. Okay, so you just need to be careful, okay, as you're running. Um, oftentimes what I try and do is get to the outside of the crowd because there I feel like at least there's a little bit of uh, room for me to move side to side um, to, to kind of get away from the crowd. But uh, oftentimes in a race of this side, even those edges are a little bit crowded too. Okay. And as we're going to talk about here uh, in a minute, your first mile should really be the slowest mile of your race. So don't feel like you've got to try and jockey around all those people, pass all those people to get by them so that you can get going, okay? Generally, when you do that, you're just going to waste a lot of energy in trying to get around those people and you risk your, your you increase your risk for injury, okay? So don't, don't worry about that. The middle of the race, the dead middle of the race is City Hall. So when you get down to City Hall, that's the five uh, mile mark. Again, as I mentioned before, those are the only two turns in the race course. You go around the square that goes around uh, the race itself. Be a little bit careful there because uh, the, it gets a little bit bottlenecked there from people just turning and that sort of thing. So just make sure you're careful there. And at the very end, 
The, the thing I think, uh, if people are here have run Broad Street before, I think you'll probably agree with me here. When you hit the stadiums and stuff, you start thinking, oh my goodness, I'm, I'm about done. That's usually where they're playing the Rocky music and stuff. And you think, oh my gosh, I have to be done here. It is still quite a ways until you get all the way into the Navy Yard and finish. Okay, But by that point, the crowd should be somewhat dispersed and you should have pretty good open room uh, to be able to um, run. Okay, Tip number eight. Um, is uh, regarding um, perhaps you're feeling pretty good in the race and you want to be able to go faster, okay, which is, which is fabulous, but I want you to be able to uh, increase your speed in the right uh, way. And what I mean by that is oftentimes people think of if I want to run faster, I just need to take bigger strides, okay, or I need to increase the distance that I put my foot out in front of me, okay which is really the, the wrong way to increase your speed. So the picture that's up here, it's a beautiful picture of a runner. You look at that and say, wow, that's awesome. Um, however, it's also a really good example of the absolute wrong way to run, okay? Because that sort of stride length there where you're landing on your heel is uh, been shown in multiple research studies. It's putting excessive force or large forces through your leg as you run, okay? This is displayed here, and in, in, this is from a, a study here that essentially shows um, the x-axis is time, y-axis is the vertical ground reaction force, which is essentially the force that's going through your leg as you land. And what you see at the line there is you'll see that uh, for people who heel strikes, so land in that position like that picture, the ground reaction force, so the force that's going through their leg when they're lay land is relatively high and it goes up really fast, okay? And what we know with patterns like that is individuals who, who demonstrate that pattern have really high peak um, and loading rate, okay? And generally, because of those types of things, they tend to get injured, and the injuries they sustain are things like stress fractures and plantar fasciitis, okay? And we see this regularly when we do running evals with people. This is one of the more common problems that we see with people, that they overstride. And what I always hear from people is I want to open up my stride that way because I want to run faster, okay? What we really try to emphasize to people is the way that you really want to run faster is that you try and increase your turnover, okay? So you're trying to take more steps in a given amount of time, okay? And when you take more steps in a given amount of time, you generally have a landing pattern that's closer to what's shown in this picture here, okay? So you can see the person's le lower leg is perpendicular to the running surface itself. Generally, when you shorten your stride too, instead of hitting at your heel, you're hitting more towards the middle of your foot or towards your forefoot, okay? Now, what I'm not suggesting here is that if you want to run faster in this race and you're a heel foot striker and you know that, that you all of a sudden change the way that you stride during the race because we've emphasized here that you don't want to change things as you're, you're running. Okay, but the point that I want to get across to you is that if you want to run faster, don't do it by trying to make longer strides. Instead, just try and increase the pace at which you turn your legs over. Okay, if you can do that. All right, and the other thing with running faster is I want you to try and do it at the right time. Okay, and I've mentioned this a little bit uh, previously. So you should really be thinking tortoise, not hare at the beginning. Your first mile should really be the slowest. Okay. And then gradually, depending upon how you feel, you can increase your pace from there, okay? So miles two to strong, or uh, two to strong, two to six, you think about trying to keep a strong sort of steady pace, and you're kind of evaluating how you feel, okay? And again, with running, sometimes during those, that uh, period of time, you might feel great, or you might feel like, uh, I just don't feel like I got it um, today, okay? But it's relatively easy to still adjust in this range, meaning that if you feel pretty good, you might be able to increase your pace a little bit. I'm not quite feeling, feeling it as much. Maybe I back off a little bit, or maybe I'm just going to try and maintain this pace, okay? At miles six to eight, if you're feeling good at that point, I would say start trying to push it a little bit, start trying to increase that turnover, see if you can go a little bit faster. If you're not feeling so good, maybe you just sort of, again, maintain that pace. And then as you get sort of towards the end, miles eight and nine, start using your arms a little bit more. Using your arms, swinging your arms a little bit more will generally increase your turnover and will help you increase your pace itself. And then towards mile, time, mile, mile, mile 10 is that time where you want to push, okay? But again, keep in mind, you, you see the stadiums, you hear the Rocky music, you still got a ways to go, 
Okay. So depending upon your ability and your ability to kick at the end, you may want to wait a little bit until you get closer uh, towards the Navy Yard itself. Okay. Number nine tip is uh, enjoy the race. Okay. I couldn't find statistics on the percent of the population that actually run 10 mile races because the 10 mile race is not as common. But the statistic for half marathon is six tenths of a percent of the American population finish a half marathon. So my guess is that probably for a 10 mile race, it might be a little bit higher than that because it's just a little bit shorter distance. So it's not that many people, right? So you finishing the Broad Street Run, you've accomplished what most people, what most Americans will never do, okay? And you should feel really good about that, okay? As you race too, make sure you're looking at the scenery. You think, oh, what's their scenery down Broad Street and stuff? It's actually a fair amount of scenery, including the signs. You'll see all sorts of different signs as you're going down. I'm not sure how well you're going to be able to uh, make these out. This bottom one says, I'm Rich's athletic supporter, which I thought was uh, sort of funny. Tone, toenails are for sissies, worst parade ever. Smile if you peed a little. I thought that was kind of creative. Or run like you stole something, okay? But get involved, you know, get excited about the crowd. You have people there that will be yelling your name, encouraging you. Use that energy from the crowd to help propel you uh, down Broad Street. And the last thing is really rejoice in your fitness. Again, there aren't that many people that can go out and run 10 miles on a Sunday morning, okay? You should feel really, really good about that accomplishment, okay? And then uh, tip 10 is recovery, all right? And as Nairi mentioned, from a nutritional standpoint, recovery from a physical standpoint is really, really important too. It's part of your training, okay? Generally, what we re recommend to people is that you try and keep moving. So don't finish the race and then flop down in the Navy yard and, and just lay there. Keep trying to walk. Keep trying to move itself, okay? Later Sunday afternoon, go out for a walk so that you try and keep things moving. An ice bath often is helpful, as horrible as it sounds. and it, it, the way it sounds is really the way that it feels, too. It's not a pleasant experience, but you will find that it is helpful in terms of your recovery. So ice baths, generally, we try and get temperature down to around 54 to 60 degrees or so, which is uh, pretty cool, all right? Generally, the way that I recommend doing it is to get in a bath of cold water to begin with and either have someone there who can start pouring ice into the tub or have ice available that you can grab and put in there, Okay. And once you get used to it, it's not so bad. You really just need to be able to tolerate it for 6 to 12 minutes, and it really does help. It does make a difference. Okay? And generally what it does do is it helps just decrease the inflammation in your muscles and ultimately helps uh, get you on the path to recovery a little bit quicker. Okay? Uh, compression sleeves here might be helpful as well. So these are a little bit different than the calf compression sleeves that I mentioned before that you might wear while you're racing. These are more like compression socks that you might wear. Again, there's some studies out there that show that they may be helpful in terms of uh, recovery itself. Uh, generally, we recommend people do some light stretching and that sort of thing to help increase, to loosen up muscles. People always ask how soon they can exercise. Uh, again, this is a little bit variable depending upon uh, what you're using this race for, okay? If this was uh, your race, the first time you ran Broad Street, then you may not exercise, uh, you may not run for a, a pretty good period of time after the race itself. And instead, you may do some low-impact, light bicycling, that sort of thing, just to be able to keep loose, okay? If this is just a race that you're going to do in the course of your training overall, that you're training for some other races and that sort of thing, you may be right back into running, okay? My biggest recommendation, though, here would be is don't forget the importance of recovery here so that if, if Broad Street was your race, that you're going to race that, don't rush back into it. Your body needs time to ultimately uh, recover. Okay. And then last, if you need help, please call us and let us know. We'd be happy to um, help you out if it's to help recover from an injury, uh, just some race day strategy, whatever it is, we'd be happy to do that. Okay. All right.